ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يحسهما فلا يضر الا نفسه اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وعد الله الذين امنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات لا يستخلفنهم في الارض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم ولا يمكنن لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم ولا يبذلن بعد خوفهم امنا يعبدونني ولا يشركوا بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فاولئك هم الفاسقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب العالمين <تصفيق> So last time I talked a little bit about some of the ijtihads or the fatawas that were given by Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu during his short period of khilafa. Today inshallah I'm going to talk about the ijtihads of Umar radiyallahu anhu. I was thinking if I should continue on Abu Bakr or if I should just start on Umar and I decided well I'll just start on Umar and and just do Uthman and Ali that way at least we get it you know i don't i was thinking maybe not to extend too much but if you go into some of the other fatwas they're also very very interesting but i'm going to talk about even with Umar i'm going to talk about the well known aspects but i'm going to give the legal as the legal side of those aspects so <clears throat> with Umar radiyallahu anhu one of the most well known fatwas of Umar is the issue of the of the 20 tarawih as you know this has become a big issue in our community so we have to understand things from Umar radiyallahu anhu his perspective on this issue and the legal aspect of this issue and uh, the opinion of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah on this issue and and some other issues that are related to this in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during Ramadan the prophet led what we call the prophet didn't call it what we call the tarawih prayers three times and those tarawih prayers were led at the hajjul time as the hadith in sahih bukhari says we were afraid that he would lead the prayer so long and these were very 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 long prayers that they thought that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go beyond the point of fajr And so they all three of the times what happened is the prophet would lead leading prayers at tahajjud time. So essentially those were collective tahajjud prayers in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Well, as you know, the fasting of Ramadan is farm. And the standing up at night is tatawwa alaykum. He has made it voluntary. So Umar radiyallahu anhu he enters the masjid one day and he sees a group of people on one side they're doing their own prayers another group of people reading Quran on their own accord another group of people doing their own prayers everybody in their little pockets and so he saw that you know after Isha prayers they were doing their own kind of like continuation because it was Ramadan they wanted to give some time they wanted to do extra uh, reading of Quran extra memorization of Quran extra dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it was Ramadan and he made the ijtihad that instead of everybody doing their own little pockets why don't we combine this into one for one group and why don't we make this easy easy meaning the word tarawih tarawih is from raha to make it easy make it easy upon everyone we won't make people wake up at the hajjud time like the prophet did 
and then have long prayers at that time, the actual original Tarawih prayers were actually very short. You would be very surprised. Umar in his ijtihad of the original Tarawih prayers, he had said if the reciter is slow, he will recite 10 ayat. If the reciter is slow, he will do the recitation of 10 verses of Quran. You can imagine how fast that is. That's like reading Surah Al-Ikhlas and Surah Al-Falaq. Okay. 10 ayat, you read 10 ayat, and then you do the next rakur. And then, he also made the point that if it's a fast reciter, then he will not go beyond 30 verses of the Quran, if he's fast. So if he's fast, if he's leading the prayers and he's fast, he'll lead 30 verses. If he's slow, he'll do 10 ayat of the Quran, 10 verses of the Quran. And this is how the Taraweeh prayer started in the time of Umar bin Khattab. He did not see this, he did not see Taraweeh prayer in contrast to the, what we call, and the Prophet didn't call it, the Taraweeh prayers in the time of the Prophet. Because they were done at the Hajjul time. Those were collective prayers the Prophet did at the Hajjul time. You can say the Prophet did three Tahajjud prayers collectively. <laughs> he never did in his lifetime what we call the Taraweeh prayers. So Umar when he made this, but he saw because people were, because the Qur'an encourages people on voluntary basis to read more Qur'an, the Qur'an in, and the Prophet encouraged also to do more things voluntarily. So he thought rather than each group of people sitting there, five people sitting there, five people sitting there, five people sitting there, why don't we combine them into one whole and we will quickly do 20 rak'ah. This was his ijtihad. The other... See, and this is interesting, okay, because there's a very interesting rule, legal rule. One opinion is that the ijtihad made by the four, meaning Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, are binding upon the community of the Muslims. Meaning if Umar has an opinion, and he executed that opinion, and no one in that community of the companions of the Prophet went against that opinion, it is called Ijma' of the Sahaba. It is the consensus of the companions of the Prophet. This is correct. And therefore, it is to be executed by any, any faqih, any, any lawmaker. When he considers law, he has to consider the ijtihad of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. <coughs> Why? Because there is the ijma' of the companions of the Prophet on their, ij, ij, on their ijtihad. Number one. Number two. The Prophet ﷺ said, Alaykum sunnati, on you is my sunnah, my way. Wa sunnatul khulafa rashidin al mahdiyin imsukhum bi ibn wajir. And the sunnah of my khulafa that will come after me, hold on to them with your teeth tightly. So, in other words, there is a legal basis to say that we have to follow the precedence set by Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali as a legal precedence that is therefore to be followed by the entire Ummah till the Day of Judgment. This is one opinion, and this is the opinion of the majority. However, there is another group of scholars that say no. The ijtihad of Abu Bakr, and Umar, and Uthman, and Ali, this is simply an ijtihad of their time, in their situation, for their particular situation, their ijtihad is not binding upon the entire ummah till the day of judgment. And this is the opinion of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. So therefore, in many of the issues where Umar made an ijtihad, for example, the 20 rak'ah of the Tarawi prayers, then Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed bin Hanbal, they <coughs> held on to that 20 because, well actually in Imam Malik's uh, uh, fiqh, it's not 20, it's 38. They do 38 because the fifth Khalifa, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, increased it from 20 to 38. But that's a separate issue. The point being that the ijtihad of the Khalifa, is it binding upon the Ummah or not, particularly the first four? Is it binding or not? So the four, the four, khulaf, uh, the four fuqaha, for example, Abu Bakr, Umar, uh, the, uh, Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Ahmed bin Hanbal, are of the consensus that if the Khulafa made an ijtihad, it is binding upon the Ummah. However, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah feels that their ijtihad is their ijtihad. And just like in their ijtihad they disagreed with one another, we also can disagree with them. And there are some scholars who have written books on which ijtihad of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman are more right versus compared to... I mean, they're all valid in a sense of legal, in legal terms, they're valid. 
But anyway, the other example of this, very famous example, is the ijtihad of Umar radiallahu an regarding the issue of talaq, for example. So talaq was done in the time of the Prophet in a certain way. And Umar radiallahu an saw in his particular situation that people are abusing the issue of talaq and they're saying it and then taking her back and, and then saying it again and taking her back. So in order to stop the abuse, he made an ijtihad. If you say talaq three times, that's it. And even if it's in one time, you say talaq, that was his ijtihad of that time based upon what he understood to be the spirit of the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet. That's his ijtihad. And because no companion of the Prophet of that time disagreed with Umar, meaning there was ijma of the companions of the Prophet on this, therefore the fuqaha of Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Ahmed bin Hanbal, and Imam Al, all four take the issue, the fatwa of Umar radiallahu anh is binding upon themselves <laughs> since the Prophet said the, the, the following the khulafa is binding upon you. Uh, Imam Taymiyyah disagrees with this opinion. He says no. Umar did this in his situation because this talaq was being abused in his situation. Doesn't mean necessarily it's going to be abused in my situation, in any other situation. Therefore, we can go back to the Quran and Sunnah and we should decide based upon what the Quran and Sunnah is saying <coughs> about if this is the way or there. I, I don't know if any of you know, most of you should know. I'll just repeat this very quickly. There are two basic opinions about talaq. Actually, talaq is a very debated hot issue. I think maybe 30% of hadaya is all on talaq. That's how many debates there are on the issue of talaq. And that's how much unsettled the issue of talaq is. Uh, hadaya is the primer book of law in the Hanafi fiqh, for example. Okay, but there are two basic opinions. One is, <clears throat> you have to, which is the sunnah of the Prophet, no doubt, meaning the way the Prophet wanted us to do it, which is that you, if you give talaq, you have to give talaq in three different occasions. That is what he preferred. Even though there are exceptions to this in hadith itself. For example, a companion of the Prophet said, I said it in anger. And you know, so, so there were all these exceptions to, to the rule. Where, but the point is, if you gave talaq, even if in one time you give 10 talaqs, it would be counted as one. And then you give 10 talaqs in another time, that would be the second. It wouldn't be counted as 20 per se. There is another legal issue which I'm not going to go into right now. There's other issues, legal issues. Is the basis of the talaq, the talaq itself, or the menstruational cycles. Uh, I think I've talked about that in another uh, khutbah of mine. But either way, Umar radiallahu anh said, if you say three talaqs, it's three talaqs. It's three talaqs for me. I'm not going to let you play around. Oh, I'm, I meant one. I said it ten times, but I meant one. And, and then another time you give another. So Umar radiallahu anh made the ijtihad that this, if you say talaq three times, it will be legally binding that you're going to be divorced. So here's Imam Ibn he says, well, that's the opinion of Umar in the time of Umar. It doesn't necessarily have to be the opinion of us in our times. So anyway, this I was just putting forward to you that some of our differences are because of this legal issue, which is that are the fatawas of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali binding upon us as an ummah or not? And majority of the scholars would say, yes, they're absolutely binding upon us till the Day of Judgment because of the saying of the Prophet, Alaykum sunnati wa sunnat al khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin Upon you is my sunnah and the sunnah of the khulafa. So therefore, I hope you understand that Islam allows for a lot of space of difference of opinion because of, because of this ijtihad, because they also disagreed amongst each other. Anyway, uh, so talking about uh, Umar radiallahu anh, what are some of the other ijtihads he made? For example, in, so now this will be interesting from a legal perspective. In the Salat al-Fajr, Umar radiallahu anh added the phrase, As-salatu khayru min al As salat salat is better than sleep. The question is, how does Umar do this? Who gives Umar the right to add something to the adhan? How does this happen? How does it, how does it happen? So again, we find when we look at the traditions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the, the, in, the importance of the ijma of the companions, the importance of the ijma, the consensus of the companions of the Prophet, the, the adhan did not come down in the Quran. The adhan did not come down in the 
in the wahi of the Prophet, meaning the sayings of the Prophet. The Prophet did not say this is the Adhan. The Adhan came down to the, to the dreams of the different companions of the Prophet. Therefore, it was nor part of Qur'an, nor part of the Sunnah. And therefore, because it's not part of Qur'an, it is not part of the Sunnah, whatever the companions agreed upon themselves became the Adhan. And I don't know if you know this, but the Adhan has many different versions in the Hadith literature, and the, and the Adhan has many different, you can say, lengths. Like there are Adhans you can, instead of doing four times, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you can do eight times. There were times where other words were used. as salatu khayrul amal. as salah is the best action, form of action. This was said in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. But what is important, why Umar was able to change the Adhan? Or after this Uthman, he was able to add an extra Adhan to the Friday prayers. Right? He added the, the Adhan that was given in the marketplace, and then the Adhan that was given in the masjid. How, did they, how could they mess around with the Adhan that much? The reason is, it was not part of Qur'an, it was not part of the Sunnah of the Prophet, it was simply a consensus of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. The companions agreed upon something, and this is very, very important to understand because Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and I've said this because people don't understand this. If you read the Qur'an, anybody who reads the Qur'an, how many times do you hear the phrase, the terminology within the Qur'an, Allah is happy with them and they are happy with Allah. This is referring to the companions of the Prophet. That legacy of Umar, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, it was, it's so important from, from the perspective of legacy and the idea of the consensus. The companions of the Prophet have a consensus on a certain issue is extremely important for, for, Islam, for, for Muslims as a civilization. But not only a civilization, especially from a legal perspective, it's extremely important. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, <coughs> so another, uh, now I re if you remember my uh, small talk, uh, today inshallah.